Makers are looking to kelp as a sustainable solution to some of the toughest issues facing our world today. All that coming right up. Hi everyone, in just a few minutes we'll get started with Woods Hole Oceanographic Institution's Ocean Encounters presentation, Seaweed Solutions. We'll hear from Brianna Warner of Atlantic Sea Farms, Robert Jones of the Nature Conservancy, and Scott Lindell of our very own Woods Hole Oceanographic Institution. We've still got a lot of people joining us, so thank you for your patience. Hello, you've joined Woods Hole Oceanographic Institution's Ocean Encounters presentation, Seaweed Solutions. We have quite a few people joining us tonight, so bear with us. We'll get started very shortly.
Hi everyone, if you've joined us for our Woods Hole Oceanographic Institution's Ocean Encounters presentation, Seaweed Solutions, you are in the right place. Um, coming up shortly, we'll hear from Brianna Warner of Atlantic Sea Farms, Robert Jones of the Nature Conservancy, and Scott Lindell of Woods Hole Oceanographic Institution. Thank you for your patience, and we are going to get started here in just a minute. The ocean covers 70% of the globe. It gives us oxygen and food and millions of jobs. It brings joy and shapes our climate and weather. The ocean is life and it belongs to everyone. Woods Hole Oceanographic Institution is the world's independent leader in ocean discovery, exploration and education, working to understand and sustain one of humanity's most precious common resources. Join us today for our ocean, our planet, and our future. Welcome everyone to Ocean Encounters, a virtual series from Woods Hole Oceanographic Institution, or HUI as we like to call it for short. Tonight's event is entitled Seaweed Solutions, how scientists, ocean farmers, and policymakers are looking to kelp as a sustainable solution to some of the toughest problems facing our world today. Hui's Ocean Encounters presentations are made possible in part by the Avatar Alliance Foundation and Dalio Philanthropies. Thank you. My name is Veronique LaCapra, and I'll be your host for tonight. Before we hear from our speakers, I'd like to take just a minute and share some tips on how you can optimize your experience with us on Zoom. Throughout the evening, our speakers will be taking questions from all of you. If you'd like to participate in this live Q&A, please use the Q&A button on your Zoom screen and type your question into the window that appears. You might be more familiar with the chat function in Zoom, but for tonight, please use the Q&A button instead. We often get hundreds of questions, so I apologize if we don't get to yours while we're live. You can ask questions anytime, starting now. I also want to let you know that we are recording this event. That recording will be made available on hui.edu, the hui.edu website after the event. We had more than 2,200 people pre-register to join us tonight, so you are in very good company. Thank you and welcome. Let's get started. Our planet is changing. The global population continues to skyrocket, and with it grows the need for food that is both good for people and good for the environment. Scientists and others are looking to the ocean for ways to tackle these problems. And tonight, we'll hear how seaweed could provide the basis for ocean-friendly food production that can help feed all of us and even combat climate change. Joining us are three aquaculture specialists. They are Brianna Warner of Atlantic Sea Farms, Robert Jones of the Nature Conservancy, and Scott Lindell of Woods Hole Oceanographic Institution. Hi there, Scott. Hi, Veronique. Hi. Loud and clear, I hope. Yep, we can hear you great. Scott, hey. help us. Uh, help us a little bit kind of set the stage and introduce us to the whole concept of seaweed aquaculture and maybe start by telling us a little bit about yourself and how you got interested in seaweed. <clears throat> sure, sure. Delighted. Well, I've, I've been growing food and water for about 36 years, first as an entrepreneur and then as a research specialist in Woods Hole for the last 20 years or so. My introduction to seaweed aquaculture or seaweed farming came at a conference when I learned about seaweed's practical use, along with shellfish farming, for extracting excessive nutrients and, and helping to clean up our coastal waters. That's where I met my mentor to this day, Yukon Professor Charlie Yarish, who technically launched commercial kelp farming in the US only about 12 years ago. Today, my research is focused largely on how we can intelligently farm the oceans, and particularly a seaweed known as sugar kelp and avoid many of the unsustainable practices that have unfortunately become a part of our land-based agricultural systems. Let me set the stage for why seaweed farming is so important and how it addresses a wide range of local and global problems. Properly placed and managed, 
These ocean farms can be restorative to ocean environments. They can help counter climate change and relieve pressure to farm sensitive terrestrial environments, places that really deserve conservation. Seaweeds are important for our personal needs. As we saw from the introductory slides, they produce healthy proteins and complex carbohydrates and micronutrients important to humans and livestock health. They are part of many of our personal care products like toothpaste and cosmetics. Seaweeds can be the raw materials for making carbon neutral biofuels and bioplastics some days. Seaweed farming is meeting societal needs such as providing sustainable jobs, revitalizing our working waterfronts and improving the US balance of trade. And finally, seaweed farming provides ecosystems benefits such as carbon sequestration, nutrient removal, nursery habitat for fish and shellfish, while having perhaps the lowest carbon footprint of any food production system. Now, let me set the context for ocean farming and seaweeds as part of the global food imperative. By 2050, the Earth's population is expected to reach 10 billion people. That's 2 billion more mouths to feed than the nearly 8 billion we have today. To add to that challenge, we'll need to feed ourselves with the looming and uncertain impacts of climate change on food production. So where will the food for all these people come from? Well, you can see from this graphic that fishing is pretty much flatlined and has been for more than 40 years. And aquaculture is projected to make up the difference in the demand of seafood um, in the coming decades, but it won't be enough. It, we can't just rely on the ocean. We can't just rely on, um, uh, we are gonna have to rely on aquaculture, we can't rely more on terrestrial farming. Um, as you'll see from this graphic, there just simply isn't enough arable farmable land available. In order to feed an additional extra 2 billion people, we would need to discover and develop agricultural land equivalent to the additional continental United States. So we need to think beyond the land. If we applied marine farming to better take advantage of the ocean's bounty in an area equivalent to the size of New England and New York State, we could harvest all the additional protein and calories we'll need by 2050, spread out across the globe, of course. Now, if you look at this next figure, you'll see that generally speaking, all forms of marine aquaculture outperform land-based livestock in several key metrics like land use and greenhouse gas emissions. But check out the shellfish and the seaweeds like kelp in this figure. They don't require any land, fertilizer, freshwater or feed. Seaweed production is basically carbon negative. It seems like magic, but seaweeds really do grow with just sunlight and the nutrients already in the ocean. And this is exactly the kind of low impact food production we're gonna to need to mitigate climate change and feed our future generations. So tonight I'm really excited about seaweed farming's potential. I've been lucky to try and tackle some of these global issues and work with a dedicated community of scientific and commercial collaborators in agencies like the World Wildlife Fund and the Nature Conservancy, NOAA and the Department of Energy. I'm thrilled to be here this evening with our guests who will share their accumulated wisdom about how we can truly harness seaweed's full potential. Thanks for that great overview, Scott. That's really helpful. Um, I'd like to now bring in Robert Jones of the Nature Conservancy and Brianna Warner of Atlantic Sea Farms um, into our conversation. Welcome to you both. There we Thanks go. Thanks for having me. Thank you. Good to be here. Great. Um, I'm going to go ahead and have you introduce yourselves. Um, Robert, why don't you go ahead? Hey, everybody. Uh, I'm Robert Jones. I'm global lead for aquaculture at the Nature Conservancy. Uh, the Nature Conservancy is the world, world's largest environmental organization, and we're focused on three uh, major challenges, tackling climate change, protecting land and water, and providing food sustainably for future generations, uh, which is where our aquaculture program is focused. Uh, I'm calling in here based in my home office in Princeton, New Jersey, uh, and I grew up fishing on the Jersey shore with my family. Uh, my career led me to focus on aquaculture because I gained an understanding at an early age that the wild can't provide us with the seafood we need alone. We need, desperately need sustainable alternative sources of seafood supply to keep our oceans healthy and our coastal communities thriving. Uh, our aquaculture program at the Nature Conservancy is focused on ensuring that aquaculture grows sustainably 
Uh, and we've focused on developing the leading science, uh, developing financial products, and farmer training programs on the ground to make that happen. Uh, we're very involved with seaweed aquaculture. It's one of the key areas that we focus uh, in the aquaculture sector. And we now have programs focused on seaweed in five countries, Indonesia, Tanzania, Belize, several US states uh, in New Zealand um, focused on the seaweed sector. So I, I work significantly with the tropical seaweed aquaculture sector. So I hope to add some perspective to the conversation uh, on temperate kelp species. Yeah, perfect. So we'll we'll get into all of that a little more in a few minutes. Uh, Brianna, uh, why don't you introduce yourself? Great. I'm um, really happy to be here tonight with with Scott and Robert and you, Veronique. Um, I'm Bree Warner. I'm the CEO and president of Atlantic Sea Farms. We are a first market company based in Maine. We were the first commercial seaweed farm based in the country in 2009, as Ocean approved. I took over the company in 2018. Um, and we've since become Atlantic Sea Farms. Um, our products, we work with 27 fishermen along the coast to grow kelp in their off season as a climate change adaptation and mitigation strategy. And our products are available both in food service, universities near you and restaurants near you, but also um, stores across the country, including Whole Foods National, Sprouts and otherwise. So we're trying to really get fresh domestic kelp into people's mouths and amplify our impact on the coast by getting more fishermen in the water as we drive demand for domestic kelp. Yeah, so I wanted to start out actually by talking more about seaweed as food. Um, I've eaten seaweed before in Japanese restaurants, but Brianna, Atlantic Sea Farms is working to take American seaweed consumption to kind of a whole new level. Basically, any recipe that calls for greens, whether that's kale or collards or chopped up celery, whatever the case, we could be using seaweed instead. But my question for you is why? Why would seaweed be better? Yeah. So one thing we, you know, people contact us all the time saying, I want to be a seaweed farmer. And what we always say is you don't have to be a seaweed farmer to grow kelp. And the way that you can grow kelp is by going out and buying it. Um, and that's what grows the industry right now and using it on everything. So um, we, we, we really talk about it as, you know, sub it in for any green. And the reason it's better is number one, it's the most nutrient, one of the most nutrient dense foods on the planet in an ounce of raw kelp, you can get, um, the, the same amount of calcium as would be in six ounces of milk uh, or half a banana. Um, so it's just this thing. And iodine was just as lacking in most of our diet and omega threes. Um, but also what it's all about, what it's replacing on your plate as well. As Scott mentioned, it is carbon neutral or carbon negative even. Um, and it is one of the most efficiently grown foods on the planet, if you think about soybeans being one of the most um, efficient uh, terrestrial aqua and terrestrial um, food to grow, ours is seven times more efficient. Um, on a four-acre farm, we can grow, you know, around forty thousand pounds of kelp, um, and wow. so in the middle of the ocean with no pesticides, no inputs, nothing. So there's an incredible. Um, amount that it is replacing and it's taking, you know, not only is it ne carbon negative, but when you replace it with some of those other very carbon extractive foods or foods that are bad for the planet or bad for you, or are done by like, you know, huge companies where there's no stakeholder engagement. Ours is grown by individual owner operator fishermen on the coast of Maine, diversifying in the face of climate change and improving the environment and improving your health. All right. But the real question here is how does seaweed taste, right? So I ordered a variety pack off the Atlantic Sea Farms website. So I've got that here, um, at least some of it. Some of it was frozen, so I don't have those parts here. But here's a couple of the jars that you get if you order the variety pack. There's one more. So we have uh, basically seaweed kimchi. We have uh, seaweed sauerkraut. And then we have a, basically a seaweed salad. So um, I, uh, well, first off, which one should I taste, Brianna? Uh, so for us, what Before. we try to do is make things really accessible for people. So you can literally stick a fork in and eat it. Uh -huh. So a lot of our other products are for smoothies, for example, right. or they're already cut shredded that you can put in anything. These three are meant for just a fork and stick in them. So the product that's really available nationally is our seaweed salad. So why don't okay. you go ahead and try that? 
Oh, this is that answer to that uh, bright green seaweed salad that you get at sushi restaurants. Right, 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 right. Well, she's opening that, I'll say right, that's go. dried. Go for it, Ronnie. <laughs> what do you think? I think it's really good, actually. So the only thing I would say is that some people might find it a little chewier than they're used to, but the taste is really, really good. Yeah, it's fresh kelp. You know, the stuff that you get in, in a sushi restaurant is imported dried. It's rehydrated. Uh, all the stuff that's added to Mountain Dew, that yellow five and blue one. Uh, if you like Mountain Dew and what it does to your body, that's exactly what you're eating when you eat that bright green seaweed salad. And then all sorts of uh, preservatives and chemicals to give it that kind of weird snap that is very unnatural. Ours is crunchy. It's fresh seaweed, but it is fresh seaweed and it's naturally fermented in barrels done by all the vegetables cut by hand. Um, and it's a, it's a process that is similar to what you would use for kimchi or sauerkraut. So Robert and Scott, how do you like to eat your seaweed? Uh, go ahead, Robert. I was just going to say, I, I'm obsessed with Japanese food. <laughs> so I'm going to have to say Japanese food. So that's a little bit cliche, but uh, I probably do eat seaweed in some form every day. And I think most people on this call wow. probably do in some form. Well, not, not in the way you think, right? If you eat yogurt, you're probably eating some seaweed. If you eat chocolate, you're probably eating some seaweed. Uh, even drinking a beer, there's a little bit of seaweed in that too. Uh, all in tiny amounts, of course. And that's uh, carrageenan. That's usually from seaweed produced in Indonesia. So an extract of seaweed, basically. Yeah, that's right. Yeah. That's right. So. Well, I, I, I'd suggest you try um, uh, wakame or alaria, which is another product that's grown in the Gulf of Maine and in Alaska. Um, uh, it's, a, it's a more tender, if, if you're interested in something more tender, seaweed, um, alaria has a, it's, it's often the, the seaweed you find in your miso soup. Um, oh, okay. It's very, very popular yep. too. All right. So I'm curious to know how many people in our audience have eaten seaweed and we've got an audience poll for you. Let's give a second here to pull that up. Here it is. Um, so the question is, how often do you eat seaweed? Um, in case you're a little confused by that last option, as much as a sea urchin, I'll give you a little context. So sea urchins are voracious uh, eaters of a particular seaweed kelp. Um, in fact, so much so that they've actually done a pretty good job of destroying kelp forests off the coast of Northern California. Um, and kelp, as we'll probably hear more about tonight, is a really critical, uh, those kelp forests are a critical habitat for marine life. Um, and scientists think that climate change and the ocean heat waves that go along with that have been killing off one of the sea urchins main predators, which is a kind of sea star, or uh, as we used to call them, starfish. Um, and that's allowed the urchin population to explode. There also used to be a lot more otters around in Northern California. They were hunted to near extinction for their fur in the 1800s. And they, they are another big eater of sea urchins. All right, so here's our results. Um, actually, we have quite a few people who uh, nobody's owning up to, not too many people owning up to being a sea urchin, but um, but I'll snack on it occasionally. And with their sushi, quite a lot of people have actually tried it. So we've got 14% who have never tried. So we'll see if we can get them to try seaweed by the end of tonight. All right. Um, so uh, are, do you were talking about different kinds of seaweed and their texture, Scott. Are, do different kinds of seaweed taste different as well? And are there some that taste better than others? Oh, yeah. Um, for instance, uh, there's grassalaria. That's a summer type grass of seaweed that's sometimes grown in other parts of the world. It's also used for agar, but uh, it has a completely different uh, taste. Um, that's one that I used to try experimentally farming in Wakoi Bay locally here. Um, but wakame and, and uh, kombu, the sugar kelp and uh, the uh, alaria species are quite different. Wouldn't you agree, Reed? Yeah, I, I think, you know, it's, I had someone the other day say, why don't you just make seaweed snacks? And it was someone that knows our stuff really well. And I was like, because kelp doesn't taste like nori. Um, it's like, it's like asking me why I can't make bananas into applesauce. Like it's, not, <laughs> it doesn't taste the same. And I think, I think the world of seaweed, the culinary world of seaweed is super exciting. And uh, all the places, the ones that Scott named are just kind of the tip of the iceberg. There's 
so many flavors. There's dulce, which tastes like bacon. Um, it's smoky. Wow. It tastes like a smoky whiskey almost. I mean, there's just so many, so much culinary variety. Um, and I think more and more chef, you're seeing that in restaurants. Um, I went to a restaurant the other day that I had no idea they didn't even did any seaweed. It was in every course. It was a seven course meal and every course had seaweed. And that wasn't the feature. And they just all add so much uh, depth to flavor. So um, as people sort of start learning more about these species, they're going to start seeing the different varieties of tastes as well. And we've barely scratched the surface in terms of what we can farm. I mean, there's right. thousands of species that really haven't even been explored for their farming right. capabilities or their culinary capabilities. And are there particular kinds of seaweed that will grow better on a commercial scale? Or how, you know, are there certain we've talked about, you know, we've started to talk about kelp. Yeah. Or are there some that grow better than others? To a point, but it's also just like Scott said, we just, uh, there's not been that many, much innovation. I mean, there've been, people have been doing small scale seaweed farming for thousands of years, but really not in earnest until the seventies um, in Asia. And then not until 2008 commercially in, in, in the United States. So that is, we are just at the beginning, at the very, very beginning of what we can do. And there are so many species in Maine and in the US that haven't even, people haven't even tried to cultivate. Yeah, so you mentioned Asia, where seaweed is much more of a staple food or at least a common food item. Why hasn't seaweed taken off yet here with American consumers? I think, um, you know, seaweed was an integral part of coastal communities diet. If you look at native recipes, seaweed on the coasts on both sides, seaweed was an integral part of those cultural, those cultures, both from um a building side, food side, and you know all sorts of things. Um, similarly, the Irish, when they came to the United States, brought with them tons of recipes with seaweed in them. We don't usually think of Irish food as being seaweed based, but in fact, if you go to Ireland and many parts of the coast, the rural coast, you still find it being used. But as, with, as is what's happened with everything in the 50s in the United States, we went from this kind of plentiful, cultural, regional, cuisines to monocultures and we most of the food we eat is from nine crops and that is what's happened in American food in general and I think it's only now only in the 2000s really where people have started to question whether if that is good for our health or good for our palates so you're seeing a lot of shift in that and part of that is seaweed being imported from Asia um, has been a rapidly booming sector when I was growing up in in Pennsylvania a sushi restaurant sounded like the weirdest thing ever um, and now you can go to the most rural part of Maine and, and there's three of them. So I think that um, in every grocery store, right? So I think American palates are changing. And I think that our reliance on the monoculture, unfortunately, uh, monocultures are unfortunately still very strong and, and very detrimental to envir our environment and our health. But I do think that there is some awareness and awakening that that is not good for us and that we should be looking back toward the, the regional foods that we've always had. Um, we have a question here from the audience uh, that's uh, food related, so I want to take it now. Uh, it's uh, Stephen or perhaps Stefan. Um, can you eat kelp straight out of the ocean? Uh, if my food safety guy was here, he would say no. Um, <laughs> and uh, that's because we in in commercial processing, you you absolutely want to have a kill step for anything that comes right out of the ground. So we, we blanch most of our product, blanch or ferment our product for our kill step. Having said that, do I eat seaweed out of the ocean? Absolutely, and it's <laughs> delicious, um, but it's not something that we recommend that consumers do, um, simply because you you know, you know wanna make sure you're getting it from the right water, you wanna know how long it's been, You know, don't grab it from the beach, don't eat it from the beach. Um, unless you really know what you're doing and what kind of water it's being grown in and how to cook it and don't leave it in your fridge for seven days because it's not going to be good. So yes, you can eat it from the ocean if it's growing on our farms. I wouldn't recommend it for many other places. It's yeah, important to note that th those waters that are farmed are certified for typically for shellfish and seaweed farming and they're safe by state and local standards. Ah, okay, because that's actually a question we have from uh, Jose, who asks, can kelps be farmed anywhere or only on, in certain kinds of water, certain areas of water? They can be farmed in Maine anywhere, but we don't. 
Um, so we, in, in many states, those are regulated for only shellfish open areas. In Maine, you can grow it anywhere. I don't know anyone who does, um, but we grow it only in areas that are available for oysters and mussels. Um, and people are in, in New York starting to grow kelp in closed areas where they couldn't sell it for nitrogen remediation and then putting it back on shore for, I mean, back on land for fertilizer. So removing the nitrogen from the water and putting a more natural source back. So there are some remediation tactics that you can do with seaweed, similar to like the billion, million oyster project or mm -hmm. a million or million, I always forget the, if it's the million or the billion, but <laughs> um, there's, you know, similar to that being a remediation project, people are doing the similar things with kelp. I, I want to pick up on that topic of, of uh, seaweed for remediation, but, um, uh, there, I want to take one more question, which is from Seth. Um, he wants to know, are there any recognized labs or regulatory agencies that are monitoring the health of seaweed the way the FDA monitors other food? Yeah, we're, we're monitored by the USDA and FDA. And similar to every other product, we have to send in test results for everything. You know, we sell to nutraceutical companies. Those are extremely robust test results. We do our own batch testing. We do heavy metals testing. We do testing on the water every month. I mean, it's it's a significant testing, plus the Department of Marine Resources tests, tests all the water that we are using at, all, at every, I think they have like monitors and they test, I think if it's not every week, they check them, it's at least every month. So it's not, it's, it's extremely well-regulated. All right. Let's shift gears a little bit from food production and, and go back to that question about the environmental impacts of aquaculture and how it can play a role perhaps in remediation. Um, before we go there, let's first tackle what might be the elephant in the room. Um, is, is all aquaculture good for the environment? And Scott, I'm thinking in particular about salmon farms here. Yeah, um, salmon farms are, are probably, you know, well, <laughs> surprisingly, salmon farming is really only about 50 years old. Um, it's quite a new industry as in terms of food production. It grew very quickly, and some of the mistakes that were made um, jeopardized the environment in which they were operating and jeopardized their businesses. Um, and they earned some deservedly bad publicity back in the 70s and 80s. And um, it still casts a shadow for, for some people. Uh, it still comes up in the press repeatedly. But I, I followed the research, and over the last 20 years, there's been a, um, extensive Pro programs, mostly in Norway, some here in the US, and reforms leading to better fish diets, healthy vaccinated fish, um, and management systems for mitigating the impact of the water quality that uh, surrounds salmon cages. Um, salmon cages typically get moved and, and the, the, the bottom sediments are, are fallowed. Salmon are still a better choice in terms of impacts to the environment than most land animal protein. Um, there are always trade-offs, uh, as I showed in, in the, the opening slides. Salmon are, are <laughs> have less impacts, but there's always trade-offs in food choices that we make. Um, virtually all of them have impacts. Uh, but interestingly, you know, some salmon farms are looking at placing seaweed and shellfish around their farms as a means of improving that water quality and improving their bottom line with uh, other products. Um, more of this is happening in Norway than here in the U.S., but it's, it's good to remember that one product's waste, like fish waste, is another's nutrition for, for seaweed, for instance, in this case. Yeah, so let's talk about how aquaculture can actually be good for the marine environment. Robert, the Nature Conservancy works on something called restorative aquaculture. What's that? Yeah, so the concept of restorative aquaculture is that actually commercial aquaculture can be one of our greatest conservation tools if deployed in the right way. So the idea here is by growing food in marine environments, we can actually improve ocean or ecosystem health. And there's two types of aquaculture, marine aquaculture, that we see as having the greatest potential for this. One is shellfish aquaculture, oysters, mussels, clams, also formed in New England, and seaweeds uh, that we're talking about today. So the idea here is that shellfish filter water, uh, they can remove nutrients from coastal waterways that are suffering from actually too many nutrients. 60% of our coastal waterways have too many nutrients uh, in them. 
these farms can are living, really living systems. They can provide habitat for surrounding fish stocks, which are now in short supply. We've lost 85% of our oyster reefs around the world. Um, and in the case of seaweed, we can actually capture carbon and contribute to the fight against climate change. So at the Nature Conservancy, we've spent years uh, working towards scientifically quantifying the benefits that these farms can have on the surrounding environment and looked at this at the global scale and what the potential is as well. Uh, we found that these farms have comparable ecological value under best practices to natural restored reefs or ecosystems. Um, and this industry provides ecosystem services or ecosystem benefits that are worth billions of dollars globally. Uh, the beauty of this concept of restorative aquaculture is that it's a market driven solution, right? Like it doesn't cost money, it doesn't cost grant or philanthropic dollars to produce more farms. Uh, in fact, the public uh, actually gets to enjoy these farms directly by consuming the delicious products that they produce. Um, go ahead, Veronica. No, go ahead. Well, I was just going to mention one of my favorite products is projects is actually some of our work in Belize where, right now where we're uh, deploy, or developing a new seaweed aquaculture industry where we're working with fishermen and women in the community to start new farms. And you know, as you can see here in this picture, uh, these farms are great sources of habitat for surrounding stocks. Actually, you can't see in this picture that we have a huge amount of juvenile lobsters that are being recruited around yeah. these farms, which is uh, great for ecology since they're overfished. But the fishermen have really bought into this as well, since that's, you know, one of the crops that are animals that they fish, uh, and they've seen that stock decline. So they're interested in supporting uh, both their livelihoods and the future of that of that population. I want to go back to, you mentioned climate change at one point, and Scott, um, how do seaweed farms compare to land-based agriculture in terms of greenhouse gas emissions? And um, there was actually a recent report from the National Academy of Sciences, Engineering and Medicine that was looking at ocean-based strategies to intentionally remove carbon dioxide from the atmosphere. And kelp uh, seaweed farming was, was an approach that was mentioned. Can you tell us a little more about that? Sure, sure. The, the, the Academy report you're referring to examined a number of different potential ocean-based solutions for carbon dioxide removal. Seaweed uh, aquaculture was only one of six that they looked at. It also, I need to preface that they didn't look at the uh, <clears throat> really the environmental impacts of uh, any of these solutions other than carbon dioxide removal. So, um, you know, large scale seaweed farming and sinking it to the deep oceans, um, while it being one of the more feasible and least risky, risky solutions, still has risks, real risks, and and unknown impacts. Um, at the required gigaton scale to really make a difference. Um, and we need to study that before uh, anybody goes too far in, in contemplating this as a large scale solution. But I think it goes probably without saying for many of us in this audience, uh, that as a society, we are going to need to make some tough choices. We, need, we are gonna need uh, carbon dioxide rem removal, not just emissions decline when it comes to mitigating climate change. And as a global community, we're gonna we're facing this existential crisis. And you know, even if the US and every country that signed the climate accords met their pledges to cut carbon emissions to uh, meet that limit of temperature rise of two degrees C, we would still need to do a lot more. And the strategies like sinking seaweed may be able to get us, help us get there. It's not gonna be a silver bullet. Will there be impacts? Yeah, but the impacts of doing nothing in comparison, that's frightening too. So we need to start making uh, some serious progress in climate mitigation because we just aren't making the changes that we're required to uh, reduce carbon emissions. And this might be where Scott and I don't totally agree. I feel like um, we know more about the surface of the moon than we know about the bottom of the ocean, uh, which is true. <laughs> um, and there are- We some often say that at Huey, actually. Yeah, yeah. Um, and I call it the S word, sequestration, uh, because I think uh, seaweed is the best possible food you can eat. It's the best possible 
input to grow for plastics, for bio, for textiles, for, you know, name anything. It's the best one out there, um, which is a pretty good claim. And now people also want to claim sequestration. We don't know that to be true yet. And what we do know is there are some solutions that we can put on land that can actually sequester fertilizers, biochar, those kind of things. As, an, as someone who's living on the coast of Maine and constantly thinking about whales and entanglement and the issues that are going on with the lobster industry to say, let's throw out miles and miles of kelp with a bunch of line on it and maybe let the current bring it to the bottom where it could maybe stay for the next thousands of years or maybe not feels like a tremendous, it feels like in where I'm from, from central Pennsylvania, where we, uh, there was a coal mine under, on, uh, on fire underwater, I mean, underground. And the forest service is like, how do we fix this? Let's put some water in it. That'll put out the fire. And then it just created steam vents everywhere that collapsed the entire town. And that fire is still burning. And so, yeah, I've lots of unknowns. With, uh, yeah. Lots of unknowns with these technologies, but uh, certainly we, we are reaching uh, kind of a, a crisis stage at this point where we may need to look to the ocean for, for some solutions. Well, um, my, my simple point is that we, we need to study these things and, and cross absolutely. them off the list if they don't, if they don't work. Yeah, um, and, and I, I can I totally agree with that. I totally agree that there are many better uses for seaweed than sinking them, but we may, we may, we may run out of time. That's my only worry. So I just want to emphasize that I think it's a great discussion, but like probably we all agree that the big climate play with seaweed is biomass production without land, feed, or fresh water. That's and that's right. amazing and remarkable story that right. uh, is very, very, very unique. Um, the sequestration could be an added bonus, right? Like we, the science isn't getting there, isn't, isn't quite there yet. Uh, it's possible that some seaweed farms uh, under their current commercial uh, business models do sequester some carbon. Mm -hmm. And uh, we're supportive of quantifying that. And, um, you know, if there's a way to optimize that even better uh, at this point, you know, we are not supportive of the idea of sinking massive amounts of kelp, uh, you know, to the bottom of the sea for sequestration purposes until we have a better understanding if that's a viable, viable pathway. Agreed. Yeah. I think I all of that. I have kind of a related question here. Uh, Philip from Davie, Florida is asking about uh, the sargassum uh, and if there are plans for harvesting sargassum. I just want to give a little context for folks who, who may not be from Florida and, and uh, not be familiar. But so sargassum is a brown uh, seaweed that's been washing up in huge quantities on, on beaches in Florida, but also in uh, beaches of Mexico and the Caribbean um, for about a decade now, I think. Um, and it's known as the Great Atlantic Sargassum Belt. And it's a big headache for tourism, um, having a big impact on tourism. Um, but maybe if we could harvest it before it gets to shore, could we help keep the beaches clean and address climate change all at the same time? Does that sound like a win-win or what do people think? But it's, it's, this, this is the very same dilemma. Um, you, we have to test these things on a small scientific scale before we even contemplate um, doing this on a larger scale. That's, but unfortunately, there are already parties, um, as <laughs> Rihanna alluded to, doing this in, in the Gulf of Maine with kelp and parties that are starting to kind of contemplate doing it on some larger scale with sargassum in the Caribbean. I think that's irresponsible unless they have a good scientific team to document the, the local and uh, uh, unintended consequences of that. All right. Um... Let's turn now to the role of industry. Um, Scott, right now, the amount of kelp actually farmed and harvested in the U.S. is a fraction of 1% of the kelp farmed in Asia. Uh, what are some of the obstacles standing in the way of the U.S. producing kelp on a commercial scale? Well, um, we are producing it on a commercial scale. There's no doubt about it. Uh, there, there are uh, probably close to 100 farms in the U.S. now. I'd say 50 of them are of some sizable nature. Um, the the real burdens, uh, the real uh, backlog or the stumbling blocks for increasing the size is one: farmers are already producing in some areas more product than 
the market can bear. So people like Bree that are continuing to innovate markets for food, that's great. Um, there's a, a gap between what is required for some of the larger applications like bioplastics and biofuels. The industry would have to be 10 times larger. And we're sort of at this Goldilocks problem of uh, we've got just enough for food markets, but how do we make this bridge to the next scale of uh, potential buyers and, and users of, of seaweed. Um, and we face a lot of permitting issues too. Permitting is still very complex and protracted in the ocean environment where we've got a lot of public stakeholders. Um, the, the federal government is trying to relax that in their federally controlled waters three miles from, from shore. Um, but the state systems are generally pretty patchwork and, and difficult to uh, manage uh, or negotiate. I'd say Maine has some of the better regulations because they allow a stepwise process of, of uh, experimental leases and then limited production leases and then commercial leases. Yeah, Brianna, give us that industry uh, perspective. What will it take to make seaweed uh, an economically viable crop uh, in a bigger way in the, in the U.S.? Um, I think that people have this very... Uh, Mis misguided thinking that it's like, we just need more farms. Um, and like, that's not even remotely the case. Um, we, we here in Maine, we have 27 partner farms we work with. I have 15 more people in the queue right now that are going to get leases. I could grow 3 million pounds next year if we thought that there was the demand for it. Um, but we, it's, it, we've grown from, in 2018, the company produced 30,000 pounds. We're growing 1.2 million this year. Like it's growing really fast. And I think I'm always a little struck by that question when people are like, how can we make it grow faster? I'm like, whoa, we've grown <laughs> like 12,000% in two and a half years. Like, can we just put the foot on the gas for a second? Like it is brand new. It is brand new. And when these things boom overnight, what I'm, I'm apparently into stories tonight and analogs, but we saw what happened in the industry in New York with hemp. It has gone completely bust because people were like, hemp, hemp's the next thing. How can we grow it better? How can we make more? How can we make more? Oh, guess what? No, no money. No, the crop failed. There was too much on the market. It, everybody washed out. I, I think that we need to be thinking about, we, we think of kelp as like, this is so good for the environment, this is so good for people. We should put all our money behind making more of it. And I think we really need to step back and recognize this is an economic good um, as well. And in order for this growth to happen, it needs to be investment in R&D with companies like Cargill, companies like um, Kellogg's, company, like big companies need to be doing R&D with seaweed so that they can incorporate it into their supply chains. They can have a little bit of kelp in every Campbell's soup. We can have a little bit of kelp in plastics, in straws, in textiles. Like this is all viable. The technology's there. We just need to further that technology outside the lab to make those vi like viable on a, on a commercial scale. The seaweed yeah, so farming is, is, is the easy part. Scott, do you have anything to, to add there? Um, yeah, I mean, technically seaweed farming, we, we can, we can do that. We can, we can make that even more efficient if we, if we, uh, collectively put our, our heads together, engineers and biologists. Um, I know, I know your lab's been working on uh, selective breeding. Can you talk a little about yeah, that? Yeah. Um, I mean, I think selective breeding could be a game changer. There are some barriers, uh, with that, um, but it can certainly improve, quality and consistency and the profitability of, of kelp farming. Um, I might be biased because I've seen firsthand uh, results where we've taken crosses that come straight from the wild and just by luck and coincidence, they produced four times the, the, the commercial average yield um, per unit area. Um, and having this kind of higher productivity for the same effort, um, you know, your, your four acre farm that you mentioned, Brianna, could be producing four times as much product without having to expand. Um, that could actually help to lower prices for the prop farm product. Uh, so it can compete with alternatives. So the Cargills and the Kellogg's of the world would, would want to buy it and turn it into some of their products. Um, and I think, uh, but 
one of the things we have to be careful about with selective breeding is it doesn't impact the precious wild resource from which it came. So we're, we're working with uh, technologies, a uh, very simple breeding technology um, that can also make our strains infertile so that they can't crossbreed and possibly impact the wild stocks. I want to bring in a question that we got from the audience. That's kind of a funny question, but also kind of an important question. So uh, this is a question related to how cows produce uh, methane. And uh, somebody wants to know, I don't have the name here, unfortunately, but um, uh, maybe it's Ken. Uh, the uh, How does feeding uh, kelp to cows help to reduce their methane emissions? Is that True, is that an urban legend? Uh, somebody want to take that? Brianna, you're on mute, but uh, there yeah, we go. I, said, I was about to say, if we want to make it a little bit funnier, it also reduces um, native native peoples and, and the Irish um, believe deeply, because it is true, that you can put it in your beans to reduce methane in your own body. I um, see. But so it is, it is uh, something that we, we know is true with some seaweed varieties. There's some really robust studies going on right now, and I'd like to make a shout out to Bigelow Laboratories in Maine that is working with us um, and Wolfneck Farm to study some of the impacts of that. There's still a lot of questions. I think it's way too early to tell what the output's going to be. Many of the tests that have gone on internationally are not with kelp. Um, they're not with sugar kelp or skinny kelp, which is what we're growing in Maine. There, there is a lot of evidence suggesting that there is serious reduction in methane emissions, but I think the data is not quite there yet for us to understand. Is it is are there other commercial benefits to that? Is you know we know for example in in some studies we found that fermenting kelp can actually reduce piglet mortality. Um, you know I think knowing our government in general in the United States and the Western world in general, like to expect that the government's going to come come along and give carbon credits for farmers is feels very far off and a lot to wait on. But if we can reduce methane emissions and provide commercial value to dairy farmers, cattle farmers, pig farmers, chicken farmers, um, you know, that that then becomes a really compelling case for how kelp can be an even more uh, climate change hero while also providing commercial benefit, which will entice that industry to buy. Because towards Scott's point, that industry does is working on such thin margins anyway. And then you say, you should buy this kelp because it reduces methane emissions. They're going to say, cool, what does it do for my bottom line? Um, and we need to prove that out a little bit too. So there's there's some really significant and interesting studies that we're really proud to be part of with Bigelow Labs um, to, to learn about what those studies are. But stay tuned. Hopefully we can come back in a few years with Dr. Price from Bigelow and have some really exciting answers for you. All right. I want to throw a question to Robert. Um, my screen just moved. All right, um, can you can you talk? And I know you you work overseas, which is a bit why I'm giving you this one. But uh, Tamar wants to know: uh, Can you talk about how this work can be inclusive, both locally and globally? Yeah, absolutely. I think one thing that most folks may not realize is that um, most seaweed farmer, uh, so most seaweed farmers actually by overwhelming margin, maybe 70, 80 percent of seaweed farmers are women around the world. Uh, particularly in places like Tanzania, where we work, where um, this is one of the few uh, opportunities for economic development and uh, empowerment in the in these uh, remote areas. Uh, so it's part of our uh, all of our uh, coastal projects are focused also on people uh, creating sustainable economic uh, and viable livelihood opportunities for communities that, that are, are benefiting the environment. So uh, that's just one way that uh, this seaweed farming benefits uh, communities around the world. Um, another question from Malcolm, how can coastal communities encourage their local businesses and fishers to expand into or introduce uh, specifically local restorative aquaculture? Robert, maybe you can take that or... or... Sorry, I missed Brianna. the question there. I'm sorry. Yeah. It's from Malcolm. How can coastal communities encourage their local businesses and fishers to basically introduce a restorative aquaculture specifically? I think that's a good one for Brie. 
Okay. <laughs> um, I mean, right now we're working, we started three years ago with, we're a little bit over three years ago and it was just ocean approved and just tiny, two tiny farms. We now have 27 partner farms, all by fishers or people who work on the water. And we have a tremendous amount of people knocking at our door to do it. And it's not because I went to them and said, do you want to fix climate change? Um, this is going to be great. It's, it's, that was never, you have to meet people where they are. And I think again, back to this, like seaweed is like a nonprofit world thing to talk about. Like it's not, this is a business and people need to make money and people need to know that in, you know, similar to Robert's work, like people, people on coastal communities are the most affected by climate change in a lot of ways. They're already seeing the change. And up here in Maine, the Gulf of Maine is warming faster than 98% of oceans in the world. And that, that center, and we are completely dependent on lobster up here. It is a lobster monoculture. And that center of lobster is moving rapidly north or east. Um, and the water is changing very, very quickly. We're seeing species here that we've never seen before. The lobster population is going through booms and busts and, and is just totally un, unreliable. Last year was one of the best catches in ever in history and no one knows why. Um, and so people do have money right now. They do have infrastructure. So instead, my background is in economic development, not in science. And what we often do in economic development is wait until something is really, really bad. And then we try to fix it. But why don't we start looking at the writing on the wall now and say, hey, when people are doing well, let's talk to them about diversification. Let's talk to them about making sure their kids can still work on the water in 20, 30, 40, 50 years. And that's where we met people was like, hey, you have a great boat. You have a hauler that can pull up these lobster lines and that can pull up these kelp lines with your lobster hauler. And for six months of the year where you're not doing a whole lot with your boat, you can be kelping and it helps supplement your income and it smooths out the, the volatility of that lobster fishery. You know, we never said climate change. And I think that's how you get people to, to do this stuff is meet people where they are, despite whatever they believe politically or what they believe about the environment, we can all meet somewhere in the middle. Well, and actually speaking of climate change, Ron would like to know how resilient is seaweed to the effects of climate change? Scott, maybe you can take that one. Well, there, <laughs> strangely enough, seaweeds are probably likely to be uh, um, one of the benefactors of rising CO2 in the atmosphere and, and in the seas. Um, that's one of the prime things that seaweed does. It takes up CO2 and it gives off oxygen. So uh, uh, kind of like poison ivy on land here, <laughs> we may see kelps being able to grow better in the right temperature waters. That's the other issue. We're already seeing kelp beds uh, disappearing from Southern New England in places that they were found quite uh, commonly uh, 40, 50 years ago. Um, so like the lobster that Bree was just talking about, kelps are tending to move northward um, as uh, the ocean warms. We're, so we're seeing, yeah, go we're, ahead, Robert. In the tropical seaweed industry, we are seeing some of the effects of warming temperatures on, on that industry already. You know, places like Tanzania, which I mentioned earlier on those flats, that water can get quite hot and actually uh, increase uh, susceptibility to disease and die-offs. And in Belize, we can't grow seaweed in the middle of the summer there. The water just gets too hot and bakes on those flats. And so part of that is we need a lot more investment into the R&D around genetics, like the type of work that, that Scott is advancing to develop those strains that are both optimal for production, resistant to climate change, environmentally sensitive and appropriate. Uh, it also may mean in some locations uh, far, far looking towards mo or oceanic sites in the places that we're looking more into open sea sites rather than farming on flats where it's typically typically done. We've got a question from Sean. Uh, we've been talking mostly about seaweed as food tonight, but uh, Sean would like to know what's the next big opportunity or use of seaweed you see in the future? Um, it's for anybody who wants to take it. Well, I'll make a, a pitch for the non-food uses for seaweed that, that have got to come inevitably if we're really going to use their climate benefits to the fullest amount and not just sink them to the bottom. I think that's a crazy idea too, but I, I'm, I'm not, I'm not uh, one to uh, rule it out in, until we uh, understand it scientifically. Um, 
as I pointed out, the, 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 the problem that's facing most of the uh, potential users of bioplastics or even biofuel is that you've got to build a big factory that's rather specially designed for kelp. It's, a, it's not the, your typical um, land-based kind of uh, feedstock for manufacturing processes. So the first, land, the first uh, stumbling block is to figure out how to stabilize it once you've harvested it, because it all comes out of the water in a few four to six weeks, typically in, in the, in the uh, spring. Um, and then, so once it's all stabilized on land in, in this large proportion, a factory can take smaller loads from that storehouse to run its operation efficiently year round and produce the plastics or the biofuels that are, that are designed for that. But we need a, a much larger mass than is currently available for fostering that. Robert, did you want to add something? I see. Oh, yeah, but well, I think we're we are close to seeing commercialization at a significant scale of bioplastics. Uh, you know, use in uh, food wrapper applications and those kind of things. Uh, textiles. I, I think that will be one uh, avenue for seaweed that is close to coming uh, online. Yeah, I think. Um... One thing that is, we always think about at Atlantic Seed Farms and that we always grapple with is when we talk about these uses for them, we need more seaweed for helping the environment. But one of the things that we've seen tremendously in terrestrial agriculture, which I think we can all agree, is the dehumanization of agriculture, where the people who grow the food are those who make the least money and that the money goes all in the hands of the few who own the companies. We know this story. We've seen it in every food industry and we're getting on the precipice often in international community calls and i'm sure that robert and scott have seen this on recommending the same exact thing for seaweed and giant farms manned by people who make no money and all the money going to a few so i think that it that it is worth taking a pause as we all sit here and talk about how, you know, in, in life, we talk about how the systems are corrupt and all the money's with a few. And before we kind of jump into bioplastics and jump into bioplastiles, I think the international community has to have a real thought about what do we want this to look like? This is a new industry. Even in Asia, it's not that big. And we have the ability right now to really think about how we want to make this a people-centric industry that rises all boats and the environment. And right now those conversations aren't happening ethically on a, on a global scale. We're just talking about big. And I think we should be talking about big and people centric and then having those conversations about that, those next steps. And those are that r and is being done, but it needs to be done with people in mind. We have coastal communities that are suffering and that need this, this work um, for the future. And only then can we really have stakeholder engagement in the future of our climate. Lots of thought-provoking issues for sure. And I just want to say that we've had over 200 questions come in tonight. So we're not even coming close to getting all the questions in and we're coming to the end of our time here. So I want to have one more question that I'd like all of you to take a quick stab at if you can. Um, jump ahead to 2050 for me, about 30 years from now. Where will most of our food come from? Will it come from the land? Will it come from the ocean? What do you think? Brianna, why don't you start? <laughs> Shit, I was hoping one of the other two would start. <laughs> uh, yeah, I mean, I, I think that there's two ways you can look at it. I think we can continue to make the stakes we've, we've always made, um, or we could take a different fork in the road. Um, and I think, that, I think that that's still to be determined. Um, I think ocean, ocean farming is necessary. I can say up here in Maine, um, it feels like, 60% of our jobs as CEOs or leaders of aquaculture in mussels, in oysters, in scallops and kelp is just fending off riparian landowners who feel like they own the water and don't want to see it. So does that give me hope for the future? No. If people are going to continue, and these are often people who politically agree with us, they love the idea of kelp farms. There might even be some on this call, but man, they don't want to see a farm outside their house. And so, no, I don't have a whole lot of hope that people are gonna choose the greater good. But man, if they do, if we can prove this out, if they do, then yeah, we can have a, 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 a you know, community of food that's grown in 
shipping containers in the middle of cities and is far more efficient and we're not shipping it all across the country, but it's actually being grown where it's eaten. We can have aquaculture farms across the country that are sustainable. So I think with every decision we make as consumers, the people on this call will determine that just as much as any policymaker of making good decisions about how you interact with the environment around you, how you interact with sustainable foods and then what you buy. All right, Robert and Scott, give us some hope. Robert, go ahead. Yeah, look, I mean, it's still probably going to be mostly land-based food <laughs> in 2050, but what we, what we do know is the sea, demand for seafood is going to double by, by 2050, and all of that growth is going to come in aquaculture. So we have a choice on how that industry is going to look going forward. And to me, uh, what I would like to see in aquaculture is bivalves and seaweed kind of leading the way, those low trophic organisms that are unfed and they're a huge opportunity. Those are great. And finfish aquaculture, uh, getting that right, getting that better, uh, it can be a really big part of the solution for seafood as well. Uh, there's a lot of excitement uh, to be excited about, about the new production technologies that can kind of avoid some of the mistakes in the, in the past, the offshore systems, the land-based systems that, that have these uh, advanced technologies that can really really advance um, the way we produce our seafood in harmony with the environment. All right, Scott, you get the last word. Hey, well, we, um, we're, we're battling cultural headwinds on two fronts here, at least. Um, one is changing our diets. I mean, it's so personal, it's so ingrained, it's so historic to our, our cultural heritage, um, but we need to do that. We need to, all of us, eat lower on the food chain and, and Seafood is one of the best ways to do that, particularly shellfish and seaweeds that we've talked about tonight. And then we've talked about some of the governance and economic uh, uh, paradigms that we have. We need to shift those so that we really do have a diversified and a, a more equal system of providing food and supplying uh, the world with, with good protein. And, and uh, it's, it's the, the profits to that are shared more equitably. But that's going to come from, you know, quarters that are beyond my technologist kind of perspective. Uh, I'm as jaded as, as many are about technology solving all these problems. Much of the problems are going to be culturally, um, uh, need to be culturally addressed first. And, and uh, but, I, but I do have hope that, I mean, I, I see a vision of uh, these interspersed farms that are not monoculture, we'll learn that lesson from, from the land, that are that are the shellfish and the finfish are feeding the, the nutrients to the seaweeds and the seaweeds are cleaning up the water. There's all sorts of great synergies there as we understand more about the microbiology of these systems too and how we might be able to uh, foster ripe and, and, and really fertile uh, systems that are, that are uh, sustaining the ecosystem rather than depleting it. That's my vision. All right. I think we'll leave it there. So uh, unfortunately, to all those of you who asked questions that we didn't get to, I'm sorry, but thank you for your uh, enthusiasm tonight. And uh, I want to say a big thank you to Brianna Warner, Robert Jones, and Scott Lindell for participating in this terrific conversation about seaweed aquaculture tonight. Thank you also to my HUI colleagues who have been working very hard behind the scenes, as always, to make this event possible. And to all of you out there who joined us tonight, thank you. Tonight's event was the first in our fourth season of HUI's Ocean Encounters virtual events. Our next Ocean Encounter will be on Wednesday, March 9th at 7.30, and it'll be about Antarctica. To register for that, the website is the one on your screen and in the chat window, it's go.hui.edu forward slash OE for Ocean Encounters hyphen Antarctica. And if we've whet your appetite tonight to try some seaweed yourself, please do check out the website of Atlantic Sea Farms. You can buy some of their great products and meet the fishermen who grow the seaweed used to produce them. You might also want to take a look at Hui's online store. We've got some very cool merchandise there. That's at shop.hui.edu. And for joining us tonight, you get a 15% event discount. Just type in the discount code SEAWEED. If you enjoyed tonight's Ocean Encounters presentation, you can be part of Hui's solution-based approach to ocean science. Please consider becoming a member of Hui. You'll be providing crucial support for our outreach and our science.
and you'll get some great benefits in return. Memberships start at just $35 a year. The average gift is $100, but any amount helps. Your support will make a difference. On behalf of Woods Hole Oceanographic Institution, thank you and good night. Out where the seas are the deepest and the mysteries the greatest lies our future. The ocean is our last unexplored, ungoverned frontier. The life support system for our planet, inextricably linked to our climate and weather and to the lives and livelihoods of countless people around the globe. But even against the ocean's vastness, humankind can be a formidable force. What happens next demands action that is rooted in scientific understanding and unvarnished truth. Because our world stands at a fork in the road. In one direction, we watch the ocean being catastrophically altered beyond its ability to sustain us. In the other, understanding outraces exploitation and we help steward and protect this most precious shared resource. What will be the legacy of the 21st century? Here and now, the world's most impressive collection of minds passionately dedicated to ocean science, engineering, education, and policy has a role to play. With the expertise to know what works and a trusted voice to present the facts as we uncover them, we can shape the future. We can inform governments, businesses, and conservationists we can be the catalyst for change and unleash new knowledge in service of society. It is more than our responsibility. It is the defining moment of our generation. We are Woods Hole Oceanographic Institution. And this is our time. <laughs>